All right, chapter two, point two. All right, so the section on, on Thomas Aquinas. So I'll open it to you guys first. What did you think? Any, uh, anything in here that was interesting or worth discussing or anything in here that you weren't sure about and needed to have clarified? What'd you think? Yes. Gives a definitive answer, in fact. Did, did you catch it? Not really. No? Okay. It's very closely related to what we ended with last week. Uh, and it sort of builds upon what we were talking about Tuesday as well uh, for Plato. So, if you recall when we, uh, last week, in the first half of this chapter, when he's going through uh, Aristotle and what Aristotle has to say about the ultimate end, he rules out a bunch of things. Notably, he rules out the possibility that the ultimate end is one particular activity that we might pursue. That we might pursue. He rules out that it's one particular end towards which other ends are sort of uh, are uh, subordinated. It can't be either of those things, because that would mean a couple of things. One, it would mean that whatever this end is is our only actual end, and the other ends that we pursue are just means, which isn't the case. Again, as we went over on Tuesday. We made this distinction between goods that are intrinsic versus extrinsic versus both. If, in fact, there were one ultimate end and only one and everything else were subordinated to it, that would be the only intrinsic good, right? And that's not right. There's lots of goods that are, that are, uh, that are some of them are, are purely intrinsic and some of them are both intrinsic and extrinsic. They are means and ends, in other words. So if something can be an end in itself, then, then it has to be that there isn't one particular end that everything else is subordinated to. So that's ruled out. Okay. It's ruled out that there's one particular activity that is the end for man. Right? And that being the, 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 the hypothetical being abstract contemplation. It can't be that because most people don't do it at all. And, then, and therefore that can't explain why we pursue the ends we pursue if it's for the sake of one end that we never wind up pursuing. Right? So that can't work. It also can't work for a couple of reasons, uh, for a couple of other reasons. One being that uh, if it were this one, particular, uh, this one particular action, then all the other actions we do would have to be for the sake of that, that action of con abstract contemplation. And they don't seem to be. And we don't seem to be acting wrongly by eating lunch. Right? That would be the implication. Because if I'm eating lunch instead of thinking, I'm doing it wrong. But that's not the case. Or if I'm not eating lunch so that I have the energy to sit and think, that's not it either. Right? Now, in this half of the chapter, he brings up another reason why the ultimate end cannot be one particular activity, say abstract contemplation. Because if it were, if that were identified with the ultimate end, then that one activity would fully, completely, and indefinitely satisfy the will. That would be the only thing we would need to pursue. In other words, if we were capable of pursuing abstract contemplation and we were able to sit and contemplate, then that would simply and completely satisfy our desires, all of them. And it doesn't. And it shouldn't. Now, it might be the, the one particular highest and most particularly human thing that we do. He's not saying it isn't. He actually agrees that that probably is the case. But it's not the only thing that we pursue. And, and if it is the only thing that we're, we pursue, we're acting in a disordered way. We're doing something wrong. OK, so ruled all of that out. And he adds a little bit to the ruling out here in the second half. But then does anybody remember what we sort of landed on as what could be or what is the, the ultimate end? Something to do with it, but how? Yeah. Okay. Do you remember the good rat discussion? Oh, it was actually good art. <laughs> it was. We didn't really wind up talking about art, which. Well, actually, not true. We did earlier on. Uh, right. We were talking about uh, art as uh, uh, an end being the object beyond the action and all that stuff, but. All the qualities of it well in the distinctively highest way that the thing is by nature capable of. So for the human end, 
What that means is doing all of the various human things in a distinctively human way. That is, applying reason to our various, uh, to all of our various ends. Because reason is the highest and most distinctive part of ourselves. That's what distinguishes us from the other animals. Doing all of the various other things that we do, all of the various animal things, living things, and being things that we do, but doing them in a distinctively rational way elevates those other things to being characteristic of the human end, qua human, rather than qua you know, carpenter or qua ant or whatever. Because we do things that, are co that we have in common with lower animals, but we do them, as, as we recall, in a distinctively human way. We apply reason to those ends. Okay, so that is basically where we ended up. But that also seems a little vague. We started alluding to some of those things, some of those instances, right? That applying applying reason to our other uh, our other other activities means that we have to do them in a, in a particular kind of way. But we need to expand on that a little bit more. We need to we need to dig in a little bit more detail and figure out how it is that works and and what those various uh, applications of reason to our lower ends what they have to do with each other, what do they have in common such that they constitute the ultimate human good. And that's where he gets to this half, that's where he gets to Aquinas. All right, so what was it? What was, what, what is it that makes something constitutive of the ultimate human end, as explained in this half of the chapter? So this is where he uses the technical Latin term. And remember the Latin term that he uses a whole bunch of times and translates four different ways? Ratio boni? Yes, that. Pronounced differently. Ratio boni. To say that something is good is to say that it, uh, that it is done sub ratione boni. What does that mean? What's one way we might translate this? Say it that louder. Sort of. I mean, that's not a direct translation, right? Um, I'm looking for a direct translation, but but. Does it have anything to do with rational? You would think, but no. Well, okay. Let's let's get into something before before you give the obvious answer. Hold that thought. Okay. Go ahead. All right, go ahead first. Go ahead first. Not, no, not quite. I mean, like, right, right, I think it's on this page. Yeah, it's on this page. He gives a very, very direct translation of it. Um, two, actually, two different direct translations. Goodness? That's the one, yeah. So it means the character, or we should say the notion of goodness. or of the good. Um, well, a couple of things about the linguistic turns on this. First of all, um, why bony could be either of the good or of goodness is because Latin does not carefully distinguish between nouns and adjectives. It's entirely, it's the same, uh, it's the same grammatical structure. It just depends on whether it's modifying something else or not. And so of goodness, meaning the, the thing that uh, something being good, the fact that it is good, is the same word and the same terminology as the good, right? Okay, so there, there's that one distinction. Ratio, and why you asked, well, does it have something to do with reason? It does. Um, the word ratio in, uh, in Latin is the rough equivalent of the Greek logos. And if you know anything about uh, sort of ancient Greek lexicon type stuff, uh, that word is notorious for having tons of different meanings. Right, so, so starting with logos and then going to ratio. So logos means reason, right? The Greek logos, it means reason. But it also means other things like study. 
Uh, it also means word, so like the spoken word. Uh, it also means language, like a language. Uh, it also means uh, uh, it also means sort of foundation. So logos means a whole bunch of different things. Ratio functions similarly. Ratio means reason, but it also means ratio, like our modern word ratio, the thing that's spelled exactly the same. Um, it also means uh, the again foundation, but a but a theoretical foundation, a basis. It also means nature or character. Um, and it means a bunch of other things as well. They are, uh, both of these are terms that carry a lot with them. They have a lot of connotations, right? And so to say that something bears the ratio boni means it bears the, uh, it, it is, it has that thing which makes it good. There's a reason that is so broad. So the reason this is so broad is to do with uh, something else he brings up later on, near the end of this chapter. Uh, and that is that when we say things are good, we are typically uh, using the term analogously. Okay, what does he mean by that? Yes, but what is that? But in what sense? He distinguishes it between two other ways of using the same terms. Yeah? Some idea? Remember any of this? No, that's more like analogy. That's, that's very close to analogy. So he gives three ways of speaking, roughly. Uh, communicating something while saying something else? Not quite. Not quite. So he says that we can speak of something univocally. We can use a term univocally. We can use a term equivocally. Or we can use a term analogously. Okay. So think back to when we were uh, when we were doing our logic section. What does equivocation mean? What's the fallacy of equivocation? Something like that. So it's using the same term to mean something in one place and something else somewhere else. You're using this one, one word which has multiple meanings. And those meanings are completely different. Right? They mean different things. A good example of, say, equivocal terms would be um, a great word that, that, uh, that applies here. Well, what we have here, right? So he uses the example of bill. So he uses three instances of the word bill that mean three different things. To pay your bill, so you know, a, a bill, say, at a, at a restaurant that you need to, uh, an amount you need to pay, something like that, a charge. Uh, Donald Duck or Perry the Platypus have bills, I mean, the, that thing, right? Or there's a guy named Bill, which refers to a person, my dad, for instance. Great. So we have three different uses of the word bill that have nothing to do with one another. My dad is not named after the quack quack thing, nor after the thing you have to pay at the restaurant. And the reason you have the, the thing to pay at the restaurant is called a bill has nothing to do with ducks. These are just completely separate uses of the same term. They have nothing to do with one another. They have no relationship to one another. They're basically different words. For all intents and purposes, they just happen to be spelled and pronounced the same way. Right? Another good example of this, one that I like to use, is bank. What does bank mean? An institution or a place to stuff. 
Right, so the financial institution or something like that, or, or a place for safe storage. What else might it mean? Ah, yes. Let's switch this. The water hits the sand and like creates the Yeah, so the other definition of a bank is something like a, a slope at the edge of something or at the side of something. So, you know, this. Right? Like a river bank or an ocean bank or a banked turn on a road or a, an airplane banking. Ah, there we go. That's an interesting distinction. What does the bank of a river and the bank of an airplane have to do with each other? Right, they're not the same thing, but they are related terms. I'm not gonna draw an airplane, but. So an airplane versus a uh, river. Both have banks. And they have something to do with one another. These meanings are related to each other, but they're not exactly the same thing, right? And they're both, interestingly, completely unrelated to the bank that you put money in. When I say I put my money in the bank, we don't mean I went and stored it down by the river. It's a different meaning of the term. But you might say that an, uh, that an airplane banks and the river has banks. They mean something similar. The terms are related, but they're not the same. Now we might use the terms univocally to say that a river has an east bank and a west bank. There we just mean the same thing. We're just referring to different instances of the same thing. Right? Donald Duck has a bill. Perry the platypus has a bill. We mean bill here to mean, to mean the same thing. It's just different cases. This one versus that one. So here we see altogether a kind of uh, a way of using a term univocally, meaning it has the same meaning, exactly the same meaning in both cases, but they're different instances. Analogously, meaning something that has similar and related meanings, but it's not quite the same, versus equivocally, where they have completely different unrelated meanings. This is why I like bank is because you can do, you can do sort of all three. Right? You probably could with these other ones too, but yeah. in any case, right? His example of a uh, of a use of an equi of a um, of a um, uh, a univocal use of a term would be man here to mean rational animal or human being, where he's talking about Socrates as a man, Xanthippe, who is Socrates' wife, is a man in the same sense, and Frank Lloyd Wright is a man in the very same sense. All of them are human beings, all of them are rational animals, we're referring to the same kind of thing, but three different instances. They all have this thing in common that they belong to this particular kind, this particular category. They're different instances within that category. Right? Okay. The example of analogous use of a term that he refers to is health. This is one that he derives from Thomas Aquinas. It's a good example because the three ways that he uses health here, referring to a healthy person, a healthy complexion, and a healthy activity, are all closely related but refer, but refer in different ways. Right. So you might say that you are healthy. You might say that your complexion or your blood pressure or uh, your hairline is healthy. And you might say that your exercise routine or your diet uh, or, your, uh, or your medication regimen is healthy. But the, these mean three different things. What are they? Different but related things. You're not sick. You don't look sick. And you're doing things that don't make you sick. Right. So one is the description of the thing itself. Health is something like bodily integrity. Right? My body is properly functioning and well-ordered and all that stuff. So it's referring to, when I say I am healthy, I'm just referring to me. When I say my complexion is healthy, I have a healthy complexion, what that's referring to is a sign of health, something that indicates that this is true. But I still say that it's, it's healthy. Right? I say the same thing and I mean something closely related but different. Same with causes of health. 
I might say that jogging is healthy in the sense that jogging causes me to be healthy. It is a contributing factor to health. But I still say that it's healthy. Right? Similarly, I might say, um, again, analogously, I might say that I had an apple this morning, which was quite healthy. But I might mean two different things by that. Again, different but related. What might I mean when I, if I were to say that I had an apple this morning, which was healthy? Your right, that's one. Is there a different one? Um, th that would only be a good choice because it is constitutive of health, right? That's what would make it good, yeah. The apple looks healthy. There we go. Or was. Was healthy, right? It was healthy not in the sense that it contributes to my health, but that it has its own health. That the apple was not rotten, or it wasn't, you know, overripe, or bruised, or, uh, you know, weirdly misshapen, or something like that. It was a nice, healthy apple of the appropriate color and texture and flavor and growth pattern and all that stuff, right? The apple could be healthy in itself, or it could be healthy in the sense that it contributes to the health of some other organism being me. Okay, make sense? Okay, so if we can use a term in any of these ways, analogously being the most interesting and most useful for our purposes here, The point he wants to make here is that we use the term good analogously. That for any instance of calling something good, we're using it in a slightly different but related way. So I might say that I am a good person. That means that I am good in, the, in a similar sense that I might say I am healthy. I am, in this case, again hypothetically, well ordered. I have my uh, I have my personhood in order in the right way. I am oriented towards the right ends, to the right degrees, using the correct means in in a good in sort of good habits of behavior, all that stuff. Right? But I might also say that, as you noticed, I did that my habits are good. That is not to say that they are themselves wholesome and complete, like I would be saying that I am, by saying I am good. That is to say that those habits are, are conducive towards my being good, my own flourishing, my goodness. They contribute to my being good. You can get it, sure. Um, so we might also say, for instance, that my, my flourishing, my being happy, in the, in the full, robust eudaimonia moral sense, is good. But it's good in that it's an indicator of me being properly well-ordered and orientated in the right way and stuff like that. Okay. okay, similarly, we might say that the various things that I do are good. But they might be good in slightly different ways. Right. And so he uses this example of, uh, of Guinness being good, i.e. constitutive of my happiness and flourishing and well-being. Uh, this is on 26, 27. That's the alcohol, right? Yeah, the beer. Right? So he says, if I want a glass of Guinness, it is because, as the advertisements say, I regard it as good for me. It slakes my thirst, it relaxes me, it loosens my tongue for a Hiberian, repart Hiberian repartee. Only a miserable sot would equate the object of this particular choice with goodness itself. So it's not that something which is good, a choice or an end which is good, is constitutive wholly and completely of goodness. It bears the character of goodness with respect to its particular operation and end. What does that mean? I just said a lot of complex things with fancy words. What am I talking about? When I say that one particular action bears the character of goodness with respect to its own operations and ends, what am I talking about? Use the Guinness example, or the later Pepto-Bismol example he uses. Either one. It achieves what you want it to well. And? Absolutely right, but there's more to it. What else? And it um, helps cultivate emptiness. 
Something like that. So not only does it achieve the end I am aiming towards, it is, it is organized as part of my sort of structure of choices in such a way as that end is the right kind of end to pursue in the right way at the right time. This is another one of those moral one, moral two distinctions, if we remember from chapter one. Right? So where he makes this distinction between moral sense one being just that you are making a choice, and then moral right, moral sense two, which is that you're making the right choice. Right. Um, in one of the texts that I didn't assign, but I have it in supplemental material, um, that is Anselm's, uh, Anselm's dialogue titled On Truth, he makes a similar distinction with respect to truth, and I think it's a good analogy. So we might say that something is true in a couple of senses. When we say, when we have to ask what, what makes a statement true, we have to first ask, what is a statement for? What, is a, what do statements do? And uh, get ideas across. Right, they convey some meaning from one person to another. They indicate something in his terms. Okay, so if a statement in, is there to indicate something, it can indicate truly in sense one, in a shallow sense, or it can indicate truly in sense two, in a more robust sense. For example, my shirt is blue. In what sense is that statement true? In what shallow sense one is that statement true? That, that's what you meant to say. Right. I intended to convey the information that my shirt is blue. It's false information. But I have successfully conveyed it to you. I have achieved the end that I have sought to pursue. I have pursued the wrong end because it's false information. I have conveyed false information to you. You can say that a statement is false altogether. It is not even true in this sense, right? If I were to say that my shirt has an IQ of 137, that's a category error. It doesn't even convey information. That could not convey information because the kind of thing that it sounds like it's trying to convey is nonsensical. It doesn't, it doesn't align properly, right? Or if I were to just string together a series of words in a way that seems to make grammatical, grammatical but not logical sense, right? Fine, that's a good example. Has you really been far, even as decided to use even go want to look more like? Call 985-655-2500 inside the details for go further and even more decided to use. You can really be far as decided twice as much to use and go wish for it. When you decide far even once to use and go want, then get really far even as decided to use and look more like and go after. It's just common sense. Apply today. What? What? Precisely. My point is that you can, of course, string together words that have no meaning in particular at all. Right? That, none of that meant anything. It sounded like it made sense if by sounded like it made sense, it, well, if by sounded like it made sense, it sounded like the kind of thing that you expect to hear in something like an infomercial. Sure, that's absolutely right. But the words put together into sentences did not convey any particular meaning. They failed to refer is the philosophical term for this. Okay, so if an action works in the same way as a statement, then your action can fail it can be disordered, or it can be good. It can fail if, for instance, uh, I were to take this piece of paper, aim for the trash can over there, and, oh wow, I didn't expect to get that. <laughs> I, well, I ruined my example. At least you got it on camera, though. Kind of. That's out of frame, so I can't prove it. Anyway, you get the point, right? So, great. I can, I can succeed at what I'm aiming at. Or, better bad example, I can miss 
there, there you go, enjoy, I missed, right? I can be aiming at the trash can and miss, right? Or I can be aiming at the trash can and actually get it in, which is an appropriate thing to do with these paper, right? Okay, um, but I also could aim at the inappropriate object. There could be this sort of middle ground, right? Where I could aim at, say, suppose I were to uh, take the, uh, the soiled wrapper of, uh, of, of my sandwich for lunch and go to toss it in the recycling bin. Right? You shouldn't put food waste in a recycling bin, right? Inappropriate object to aim at. So even if I tossed my you know, food soiled paper into the recycling bin and even if I made it, even contrary to my expectations, my, my action was disordered because it was aiming at the wrong it was aiming at the wrong end. Right? So we have these sort of three layers here. Okay, with me so far? Okay, so for an action to be good, for to, for to bear the ratio boni, the, the characteristic of the good, the character of the good, the notion of the good, what have you, it has to fulfill the end it is aiming at and it has to be aiming at the correct end. We determine what the correct end is by its particular location, metaphorically, uh, within our structure of actions and choices. A Guinness is good. Sixteen of them is not. There's a difference there, right? And it's not just like diminishing returns or anything like that. There is a point where, where, uh, where a Guinness after 15 previous is, it's the same physical thing that you are ingesting, but there is a point at which uh, that you are not actually performing the same action. You are, you are, rather than enjoying a nice cold Guinness, you are getting shit-faced. Different actions, right? Similarly, um, medicine, right? Taking Pepto-Bismol, to use his other example, is good. But there are times when it's good and there's times when it's a, a waste of time or a waste of effort or a waste of money or, or inappropriate, right? If you have and do not expect to have any particular stomach trouble, then taking Pepto-Bismol has no particular purpose. But if you do have or expect to have some, some digestive issues, it can be good for the purpose of that particular end within that particular case and within that particular setting. Because the end it achieves is a correct kind of end which is appropriate and ordinate to your, uh, your overall flourishing. Okay. So, all of this is uh, in part to head off one potential, um, one potential objection to the view that we have one ultimate end towards which we all strive. And he talks about this quite a bit throughout the chapter. And it is this, this, potential, uh, this potential problem that if we have, if we all share one ultimate human end, whatever that might be, that being the, the, that which bears the character of the good, if we share one characteristic end, then it seems to follow that we all ought to be acting in the same way. Because if we are acting differently, it seems that we are following, we are pursuing different ends. And if we are pursuing different ends, then it seems like some of our ends are better than others. My ends might be better than yours, yours might be better than mine. And so what that means would seem, what that seems to mean is that our diversity of choices and activities is only due to our moral failings. We are only different from each other because we fail to do the good in different ways. We, we see how this follows? Is this making sense? This is where he also brings up um, more and hair because they provide another alternative, an alternative way of looking at things. And, and it's, again, it should be obviously mistaken, but we have to look at why. But, but to look at that, we have to see the, the sort of force of this objection. Right. This is the idea that 
we are only distinguished by our faults. That if we were all perfect, we would all be the same. McInerney is saying that's absolutely not the case. And the reason that's absolutely not the case has to do with this, that things are good insofar as they bear the character of goodness, not that they all pursue the same particular common end. This actually comes, to, comes back to this. Uh, there's a similar case in, say, in literature, whether that's reading or whether that's writing, <clears throat> where we tend to think of, uh, of our characters, whether the characters we write or characters that we enjoy uh, reading or watching or whatever, as defined in large part by their flaws. Right? We might think of what makes a character interesting is what's, what, they do, what they do wrong, right? what their character flaws are, that sort of thing. What distinguishes them from other characters are their, their particular faults or their particular flaws. Right? We even probably think of the tragic hero as being defined by some major overarching character flaw that drives the narrative. Right? We get that from Shakespeare. Primarily. But there's a difference between how the tragic hero works in modern literature, dating back to Shakespeare, and how the tragic hero worked before that, dating back to the, the sort of classical Greeks. Does anyone know what the difference might be between a tragic, a sort of Shakespearean tragic hero versus a classical Greek tragic hero? And still do the right thing, but all things happen to them? Something like that, yeah. Right. So the big difference is that the sort of modern qua Shakespearean tragic hero is defined by a flaw, and that flaw drives the narrative. That is what creates the tragedy. The classical, uh, primarily Greek, but also Roman, also medieval, the classical sort of um, tragic hero going back to Homer is not defined by their flaws if they even have any. They may not have flaws at all. Or at least not more not, you know, narratively significant flaws. The narrative comes from things happening to them. It is their conflict with the external world, not their conflict with themselves. Right? So, I mean, think about it like think about it like this. Odysseus what are Odysseus's flaws as a character? It's not much, right? I mean, maybe you can say curiosity, because that's what leads him along some of his various misadventures along the way. But that's not a that's not a major flaw, and we probably wouldn't even think of that as a flaw. He was an explorer anyway. Right. He doesn't have a, a defining flaw, but you can pick anyone from any of, uh, any of Shakespeare's tragedies. You can point to a particular defining character flaw. Pick your favorite. Um, the lady from The Taming of the Shrew. From which one? The Taming of the Shrew. Oh, um, right. It's been a while. Um, that it's, it's her controllingness, I guess you'd say? Your desire for, for, for control or something like that, that that causes things to slip out of her grasp and things to spiral out of control. No. It's an excess of some, it's an excess or a deficiency of some virtue, right? And so we think today of flaws as being that thing which distinguishes person from person, but, but that's, that's not necessarily the case. It could perfectly well be that we, we can act well, we can do the good in a very distinct personal way. I can do what I do and I can do it very well and you can do what you do and you can do it very well and we can do radically different things and both be good. Right? We can both live happy, flourishing, fulfilled lives, but those lives be radically different because the character of goodness is instantiated in all of our various actions and all of our various ends. Unjust, even though like you're just, and being viewed as uh, just, even though you're unjust, kind of, sort of. You can relate it to it, okay. right? So that so even so, if we're talking about this in 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 Plato's terms, right? So the perfectly just person who acts justly in every case, even if bad things are happening to them, that is not 
necessarily just one particular course of action. Right? Doing the right thing, first of all, may vary depending on your circumstances, but it also may be an array of options, each of which you could do particularly well, especially if you're a, a good, well-adjusted, well-rounded person. You might have an array of options laid before you, no one of which is the exclusive right choice. They can all be good. Think in terms of like career choice, right? This is kind of contrary to Plato. But presumably, you could make any number of at least several career choices and be good at them, be happy, be effective, and be well satisfied with a bunch of different career options. Maybe even multiple. You might go from one career to another at some point, and that might be a perfectly reasonable thing to do. <clears throat> and and there's, there would, even if you've made a good choice there, <clears throat> that isn't to say that having made a different choice would have been bad, right? Now, maybe it would have. <coughs> Just because there are a bunch of different right answers does not mean that there aren't also a bunch of different wrong answers, right? Um, I, I perfectly well could have gone into a different field than, than teaching, and I could have done quite well at it. But there are also fields that I would not have thrived in. Fiction writing, for instance, as I've, I've talked about. I can't do like dialogue. I've tried, and I failed. I write dialogue like George Lucas. It's bad. Um, so the, if I were to, instead of being a teacher, if I were to try and be a screenwriter, for instance. That means your things would be great. It would be great meme material. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes, I could be the next Tommy Wiseau. Um, I'd, I'd rather not, though, see, because again, I, that, that does not seem to me, at least, to be a particularly happy and fulfilling life, because I will have ultimately failed at what I was attempting to do. So there are things that I could do which I shouldn't do. There are, there are various things which I could do that are, a good, there are, are good things for me to pursue. And you can pursue the good life in, a, in sort of a plethora of different ways. And so there can be a diversity between persons and the, between the way that we choose to do things. And that is because what makes our choices good is not that they are pursuing some particular end, but that they bear the character of goodness such that they fit themselves neatly and properly within a well-ordered life. Okay. Okay. With me so far? Making sense? Pretty good. All right. So one of the uh, sort of um, alternatives and objections he brings up is this position from uh, from G. E. Moore and R. M. Hare, which is considering the good as a kind of logical framework rather than as an end. Because right? all of this talk does seem like we're we're sort of moving away from talking about the good as a as an ultimate end, and it seems like we're talking about it as a quality that certain actions and certain ends have. It's not quite right, right? He's getting to, uh, he brings up this, uh, this alternative view that Moore talks about uh, goodness. When we call something good, what we mean is that it has a certain logical framework, that, that we are speaking about it in a particular way. That's all we mean. With it, by when, when we call something good, we are, uh, it is a way we have of describing it, that that's all. And again, it's easy to fall into this when you're talking about sort of things bearing the character of goodness or being under the description of the good, that sort of thing, the, bearing the notion of good. And Hare also, uh, another sort of exemplar of this view, uh, he says, uh, quote, Hare treated good as functioning in a purely formal way such that I am committed to a series of logical moves if I am morally serious in saying, for example, that it is morally good for me to renege on my debts. So basically, um, this is the perspective that in order to judge something morally, your primary consideration should be internal consistency. So if you make a moral statement, to make a moral statement is to apply it universally. To say that such and such is good is to say that it's the kind of thing that, that everyone could and should do, not just me in this particular case. right? And so uh, he, he uses Hare's example of the, quote, fanatic. He says, um, quote, he imagines a man who wishes to kill Jews. 
we don't really have to imagine. There are historical examples we can point to. If this example be generalized, he must agree that should he himself turn out to be Jewish, he too is a candidate for extermination. Hare's, quote, fanatic is willing to do that. This purely formal approach deprives Hare of any basis for saying that exterminating Jews is wrong in itself. Essentially what this does is it reduces moral criticism down to criticisms of consistency. Essentially it says that the only manner of criticism available is hypocrisy. That you are inappropriately or incompletely applying your principles rather than that the principles are bad. We should, I think, be more willing to say that the principles are bad, and hopefully we are. Right? McInerney's point is that we can in fact say that certain principles or certain, uh, certain ends that we have are misaligned or disordered, that we shouldn't be pursuing those ends because those, those ends do not bear the character of the good, at least not really, but only do apparently. Right. Now, taking a step back, giving, giving the devil his due, so to speak. Criticisms on the basis of inconsistency or hypocrisy are perfectly valid. Right. You can criticize, say, Adolf Hitler for uh, wanting to promote the, uh, the future good of the Aryan race while he himself was a short, balding, dark-haired man. Right. He didn't exactly measure up to his own standard of the Germanic Aryan ubermensch. And so we can say that there is a sort of criticism that we can apply there in terms of inconsistency. That if he were to completely and consistently apply his principles, he should have also subjected himself to eventual extermination. Okay, yeah, but that's a really shallow critique. There are more important things to criticize, say, the Nazis about than, than ideological inconsistency. Right? The murderous ends towards which they, uh, they aimed themselves are themselves wrong. Those are the wrong kinds of ends to pursue. Exterminating people groups, in other words, like genocide. If you can only criticize on the basis of inconsistency, yes, you can in fact criticize most people who have bad ideas. Because most people who have bad ideas are hypocritical about them. They don't universally apply them. But if you're going to criticize them for being hypocritical, let me put it this way, be careful because they might just decide to apply their principles universally and then just go, go full bore into it. In other words, you might, you, might in, you might somehow convince the Nazis to slaughter more people. Right? That's, the, that's precisely the wrong kind of criticism uh, for, for an end which is inappropriate or, uneth or unethical. Right? Rather, we should be examining whether, in fact, the end is itself worth pursuing. And in order to do that, we have to look, look to whether it actually bears the character of the good and whether, of that, whether that character of the good fits within a, uh, an overall framework of goodness within a, uh, within a life, within, within uh, a, a set of human actions. OK, with me so far? Make sense? OK. So. 13 minutes, that'll do. So um, if we were to look as well at how we can determine whether something, whether something does actually bear the character of the good, we can look at the nature of the thing. Right? And again, this kind of comes back to the good rat discussion from last time, two, time, two classes ago. Um, and it brings up the question of how we determine whether something is good, whether the thing itself is good. Right? What makes a thing good? And this is, uh, this is, we're gonna be working with a principle like this that he really alludes to here and expands upon much more later, um, which we're going to call the the convertibility of the transcendentals particularly of goodness with being, but we'll get exactly to what that means. But first I want to illustrate with an example. It's one you're going to hate me for once again. It is the perennial question, the very difficult question, the, war, the question that I'm surprised hasn't started more wars. 
What is a sandwich? Okay, the Earl of, the Earl of sandwich. Well, he invented it, but what did he invent? Two pieces of bread. Two pieces of bread. Uh, with okay, so let's be with what? Um, you want specifics or just like? You mean definitions? With other materials in between. Yeah. Okay. All right. So my job here is to provide you with counterexamples to show that this is a problem. So I can give you examples that fit this description that, that are definitely not sandwiches, and I can give you examples of sandwiches that do not fit this description. For example, is this a sandwich? We're looking at that. Two people have placed something between two pieces of bread. Something being the planet. Yeah. Sandwich? Yes. That's not edible. Then is it a sandwich? Okay, I would say not. By our definition, we gave yes. Right, so that's a problem. All right, how about... Um, This. Is this a sandwich? Are those things both connected? Yes. Subs meet in the back. There's one piece of bread that is cut down the middle, but not fully. Is it still a sandwich? No, it's, it's a, a near sandwich. It's a sub, which is similar to, maybe analogous to a sandwich. I don't know. I would call that a sandwich. I think that's fair. It's a subcategory, if you will. That's good. That's good. I like it. All right. Um, yes, I do think that this is a subcategory, if you want, of a uh, of a sandwich. And so maybe we uh, we can't say two pieces of bread. Maybe it has to be between bread. Or maybe it can be uh, between bread, but or maybe between even two pieces of bread. But here's another problem. Um, how about? This. How does it make sense, though? What if you put the lid back on top? That doesn't make sense. Food, even if we're specifying food, between two pieces of bread. A taco is another example. Yeah, is a taco a sandwich? Because if we're now if we're getting rid of the two pieces of bread requirement, it seems like it has to be, right? It's bread that is that encloses something. Yes. If it is, then how about a burrito? Mm, okay. Okay, a wrap. So if a wrap is because it's something bread like, what about a lettuce wrap? No, that's what I was gonna ask. What about lettuce wrap? No. Yeah, I think so. That's controversial, but I think so. Um, how about um, how about that? It's not bread, it's a cookie. It is food. Not technically a sandwich. Mm. It has the sandwich in the name. Let's go a little further and talk about the sandwich cookie. Not a cookie sandwich, it's a sandwich cookie. So, ah, that's important because sandwich modifies cookie. So it's a sandwich like cookie. It's a cookie that's like a sandwich. So maybe it's not a sandwich. Maybe this one is analogous. An ice cream sandwich, I would say, is a sandwich. Yeah, ice cream is the as the middle. That's fine. All right. So why? How can we do this? Right. It seems like whatever we determine about sort of our configurations, we have to we have to run into issues. All right. How about? It's like almond milk, like like actual milk. It's a branding thing. Um. How about uh? Where's uh? Here, these, 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 Californian and. 
this says Kentucky. It's a lie. This is a Californian monstrosity is what this is. This is, this is the culture of California typified. Is that a sandwich? They're not together, so. Right. You can make it into a sandwich, but you haven't, and so it isn't, the right? Parts to make a sandwich, but it's not Right. So, one more instance that will hopefully do some more demonstration here. This. This is, uh, again, if we're willing to accept the whole it's connected in the back thing. I think it's fair to say that this is a sandwich, right? Okay, tell me when it stops being a sandwich. I agree. Correct. It keeps getting worse. Don't worry. OK, now hold on. Is that a sandwich? Yes. It's a very moldy sandwich. OK, listen, 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 listen. If I said, hey, would you mind bringing me a sandwich? And you brought me this, I think I would be rightfully upset. There's an unspoken part of a sandwich that is edible. No, that's part of the definition. I think that's part of the definition. And it's not just edible, right? It's not just edible. This is edible if I had a blender, right? I could ingest this. That's closer, right? So it has to be not just without dying, but it has to be well because I could again I could consume this without dying. It wouldn't be good for me, but I could do it, right? It has to be first of all food, and it has to have a you know a particular configuration. But what is food? How do we define what is food and what is not? Right, it's what it does, right? It provides net positive nutrition to the human body. That's what food is, right? So this is food. This is not. It's not people. This is close, but it's been sitting on the counter for two days. So it's probably food, but it's not good food. So what we have here is this interesting case where we have something that is food. It goes from a perfectly reasonable good sandwich to gradually it gets worse and worse and worse over the course of several days until at some point it stops being the kind of thing that it is. It stops existing at around this point or so, I would say at least. That's no longer a sandwich because it's no longer food and it's no longer for the purpose of eating and providing nutrition, you know, that thing that food is supposed to do. Right? So we can also look to the configuration. Why is a sandwich configured in the way that it is? Why is it between bread, say? I'll give you a um, counterexample. Why not that? Oops. Uh, because it makes a mess. Right. So why are sandwiches the way that they are? How do you eat a sandwich? things without making messes. Yes. How do you eat a sandwich? Yeah, with your hands. Now you don't have to, but that's how it's designed. It's designed to be eaten. Uh, it's designed such as to be conducive to be eaten manually. I'm not saying you have to do it that way. You can, in fact, use a fork and knife for a sandwich. You'd be a little strange, but you can do it, right? It's possible. There's nothing wrong with it necessarily. Yeah. And it, yeah, right. And so there, that's a flaw with the, with the sandwich, right? If you have one of those burgers that as soon as you take a bite of it, everything just blasts out the back all over your plate, there's something wrong with it, right? Question. Poorly designed. Yeah. Our food requirement. Mm -hmm. Does that mean? For humans, let's specify. Okay. Go on. Is that where you're going with that? No, it's more of a not all humans can eat it. True. With actually True. getting it. Positive right. So, I mean, so, if we're just talking about a proper PB and J, yeah, if you're allergic to peanuts, that, then so would that by technically not be a sandwich? It is. It's just not the kind of sandwich that you could eat, right? The the, the flaw, so to speak, is with your with your um, digestive system, something like that. Right? Your peanut allergy is something wrong with you. It's not something wrong with peanuts, right? It, it's a it's a health deficiency, not a not a sandwich deficiency, right? Something like that. Yes, but, but the human digestive system is not is not designed, so to speak, to to digest that. Right. 
This is not the kind of thing that our digestive systems are ordered towards naturally. Peanuts are, but some of us have something wrong with our digestive system such that peanuts cause problems, right? Okay. So, what is all this to say? This, all of this is to point out that as something gets worse and worse and worse and worse, it stops being able to fulfill the function that it's for. As something gets worse and worse and worse and worse, eventually it ceases to be. It passes out of existence. It isn't a sandwich anymore at some point because it fails to be the thing that it is. Now this doesn't also, this also by the way, doesn't have to be rotting, right? Um, this can be just, you know, eating it. You can eat something and it'll gradually pass out of existence because you, it, it is no longer capable of doing what it's supposed to do because it's being digested, right? Okay, one final question. Is this a sandwich? Yes. No. Why not? Is it the crust? No, that's not why. Can I eat this? Yes. No? Yes. No. no for Can I eat this? <laughs> okay, so the thing isn't real. It doesn't exist. And so no, it's not a good sandwich. It's a picture of a sandwich, right? So, so, so what I'm getting at here is that the goodness of something corresponds in a one-to-one -one way to its existence. Something which exists is a good instance of the thing that we are talking about. The better something is, the more it exists. The less something exists, the worse that it is. And so for something to be good, a good instance of the thing that it is, is for it to fully instantiate what it is to be that thing. And so when I say that something is worse, I mean that it is less of that thing. Which is the better sandwich, a whole one or a half one? It's the whole one, because there's more sandwich there. It's a more complete thing. <laughs>